great to see you all in this room. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of places in the middle, so try to scoot over and find a, find a spot. So please stand up for people if they want to pass you. Um, so welcome to this talk. And um, we both work at InfoSupport. And InfoSupport is a company where we like doing work that is, we call it awesome sauce. I'm not sure if you uh, if you have spotted our booth, maybe during lunch lunch break, but we were uh, we were serving uh, toasted sandwiches uh, with the special sauce applied. So who who tasted one of them? I had a, I had one of them. It was I think they were great. Yeah, um, and of course the awesome sauce is a bit of a bit of a gimmick, but there is a real sense to it. In 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 the case that when we do a software project, we really want to add a special touch. You know. Um, um, a lot of smart, smart pe people work at our company. We want to work with the newest technologies, the most innovative things. But the awesome sauce is what makes our project special. So if you're inter interested, please visit our booth afterwards. Now, this conference is also about a lot of awesome stuff. Most talk we attend are about very awesome stuff. At least, I hope so. Um, well, this talk is very different. Not gonna be about awesome stuff. It's it's gonna be about stuff that went wrong. It's not gonna be about successes. It's gonna be about failures. Stuff that seemed to be quite awesome at the start, but turned out to be not so awesome at the end. And it's also gonna be about how we can make sure this doesn't happen too often. That you that you won't be surprised in the end by uh, a negative outcome, for example. Now, I said we because this talk is co-hosted by my colleague and my very good friend, Martin Mulders. He's a software architect, he's a developer, a trainer, and he's also a conference speaker. And he's a colleague of mine, so he also works at Info Support. Well, don't you get to introduce yourself, Hanno? Yeah. Yeah, don't you get to introduce yourself? Please meet Hanno Ambres. as I said, he works at InfoSport, he's a software engineer, trainer. Like me, he's a public conference speaker and also a very good friend of mine. But this public speaking, how long are we actually doing this alone? Well, that's been uh, quite some time. I think it was around 2017 that we started the public speaking thing. And uh, I actually found a very ancient photograph uh, in, a, in a box on my edit. Uh, I can see it. Ancient. It's ancient, you know, yeah. the colors have faded and everything. Uh, so this was actually the first time I did a talk, and it was in 2017, and it was at uh, the conference J Prime in Bulgaria. Um, but I, rem I remember this conference quite vividly because, apart from my talk, almost all of the other talks were about blockchain. Oh, it was totally new and cool. It seemed that you could solve just anything with it. Great. Really? Anything. Yeah, I did. Yes. It's working. It's back. Thank you so much. So, of course, anything blockchain. It, it, it was like the problem solver of that age. I mean, we always have this, this problem solving that, that fixes everything. I mean, we've had microservices, and microservices would solve all your problems. Then we had NoSQL instead of traditional databases, and they would also solve all of your problems. And well, I guess in 2017, blockchain was the ubiquitous problem solver that was that would just take care of everything, right? Yeah, funny thing, the cryptocurrency trading com community thought the exact same thing. Blockchain would solve everything, and it was reflected in, in the price, the price charts of blockchain. So this is a price chart of blockchain in 2017. Um, so speaking of blockchain value, Martin, how much are your block? Uh, yeah, you are a... Bitcoin's currently worth. <laughs> I never bought any, so they're worth nothing at all. Uh, now I have to tell how much mine are worth. Um, you dare to do that? Yeah, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hodling for now, okay? Oh, yeah. yeah. Seems, seems waiting, like a great waiting. strategy. Yeah, yeah. But maybe you were the smarter one not buying them at all. Um, yeah, it was uh, quite a year, 2017. Don't you think so, Martin? Yeah, absolutely. So 2017, we had, we had elections in that in the year, didn't we? For parliament, if I remember correctly. Yeah, you're right. We had elections for the Dutch parliament. Um, that's right. Um, and I remember taking part in the voting process, and I remember finding myself in the boat, voting booth, doing that, right? Everyone who is a Dutch citizen remembers this, can relate to this. And I thought to myself, what on 
earth am I doing here? I'm holding a red crayon. I'm about to color a checkbox on an enormous piece of paper that you have to fold out, you know? In this exciting age of digital technology. What are we doing? We can make computer programs that beat human players at a complex game like Go. Not even chess. Well, of course we can make them beat players at chess, but Go is much more complicated. We can make computer programs beat them at the game. Surely we can create some voting machines that support our national elections. Piece of cake, right? Well, it should be. Uh, but in fact, we have had voting machines. I, I remember myself with, with a voting machine and looked pretty much like this and, well, I, I could cast my vote yeah. in this way. Again, so what you're, happened? Again, you're right. Uh, the voting process in the Netherlands went digital as early as 1991. And it stayed away for over 15 years. But after 15 years, in the year 2006, the Dutch Secret Service, for the Dutchies out there, this is the AIVD, they discovered that the radiation that these machines were emitting was detectable. And it was detectable for, for, uh, over a distance of over 20 meters, which meant that it could be detected outside of the building where the voting took place. So the secret ballots could no longer be guaranteed. And in 2006, the machines were discarded and the Dutch government had to decide that they would revert to using the big fold-out sheets of paper and the red crayons. Well, I actually remember there was a second thing why they, why they got away from the machines because the, the vendor refused to, to tell how the machines worked. And that way, it meant that the elections wouldn't be transparent. No one could actually verify that if I would press this button, that it would count as a, as a vote to that specific person and that specific party. Mm -hmm. But that's also a, a thing. But boy, we're 2019 right now. Yeah, modern yeah, time. That, that, that's more than, than 10 years later. There's, there's, there's got to be something new, right? That's the ex exactly the same thing I thought when I returned home from voting. So I searched the internet for any plans to replace this prehistoric process that was currently in place. You want to know what the government's point of view on the matter was? Well... Meh! To summarize this emoji, nothing was happening you, at all. You can't be serious. Nothing? Nothing was happening. They, they were just planning to continue the sheets of paper. St they, are, they are still planning to do, to, to do that, by the way. Next elections will also be on the sheets of paper. So That's quite a shame. I thought in 2017 it's time for another attempt. And blockchain was the obvious choice, right? Being the coolest kid on the block at the time. Um, so I started a research project to put blockchain to the test, to see whether it really was a good fit for everything. Sounds interesting. What did you do, Anna? Yeah. Well, at first I thought that this will be a good fit because of blockchain's distributed nature and also because of the fact that transactions are always permanent in a blockchain. So what did I do? I recruited some colleagues with some interest in the technology and the project. And I also found a potential customer because at InfoSupport we have a works council. In Dutch, this is called Ondernemingsraad. And they were planning elections. Uh, they wanted to promote the elections because the, the elections that took place like a few years earlier um, um, people weren't really enthusiastic about it and they wanted to promote it. So they thought, why wouldn't we just add a cool buzzword and maybe everyone will come, you know? Yeah, blockchain. Yeah, there was, this, yeah, there was this company that sold uh, uh, Ice Tea and once they changed their name to Ice Tea Blockchain, the shares uh, tripled, you know? So yeah. why don't we do, oh, the we, same we can do the same with our internal right. elections? Yeah. So it seemed like a great fit because for us, this will be an internal test case, test case with a limited number of ballots, not like 11 million people, but just like, 400 or 500 people. So limited scale, an ideal test case for us. And once it would become an enormous success like everything that blockchain was ever applied to, we could scale it up to serve the whole country. Yeah. Sounds great. So let me guess. You anticipated the success and the success actually got real. The, success, the, the elections had a 100% show up. Everyone voted. Everyone was enthusiastic about it. And now you're scaling up, and 2021, when we have next year, uh, next time parliament elections, we'll actually be doing that on a blockchain, right? Oh, how I would love to say yes to that. Well. But not exactly. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, as we set out to digitize our local works council elections, we were very eager to exper experiment this smooth sailing experience 
that uh, all these 50% of talks, of all, all the majority of the talks promised to us, but we ran into problems right from the start. Because when we started our research, we found some blockchain decision models online that, that, that told us maybe you should think about whether you want to use blockchain because there are certain characteristics that, that are present in blockchain and they need to be, uh, you need to apply them in a good way to your case. Um, so we looked into these models and they really made us question whether blockchain was a good fit at all. For example, this one. Well, <laughs> I like this one. It does make a few excellent points, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, a few excellent points. <laughs> And one major point, um, yeah, but of course, we, we weren't giving up hope. I just searched for another uh, decision model. And the next one really made me lose hope. Can well, you maybe see uh, why, Martin? Well, at least it has a lot more options than yeah. the first one. Well, we can just try to fill it in, right? I mean, yeah. let's, let's start at the top. Let's do that. Yeah. Do we need a database? Well, we got to store those results somewhere. So I guess we do. Yeah. Does a database require shared write access? Well, we have a lot of uh, ballots. We have a lot of people that can vote. Um, everyone needs to be, to be able to do one right. So I guess, yeah, we do. Okay, next one. Are the writers all known and trusted? Well, we know exactly who works at the company. And well, we can trust them more or less because we already hired them. So the answer is yes to that one as well. Let's see. Uh, are their interests unified? Well, yeah, more or less, I, I guess. Yeah, let, let's go for yes. Then don't use a blockchain. That's a bit disappointing Aww. for you, Hanno. <laughs> but, well, maybe for a second, let's just assume that the writers aren't having shared interests. Maybe some people want to actually influence outside the regulations. So the writers' interests aren't unified. Well, then the next question is, do we have, can we use a trusted third party? Well, that in this case, that would obviously be, obviously be the company itself because they regulate the whole process. So then again, uh, the answer is yes, and well, there you go, back again. You don't need to use a blockchain for this. There you go. Interesting strategy, by the way. We, we tried that a few times. Just take the wrong exit and see if you end up at blockchain anyway. Right? <laughs> but it, of course. Yeah, but it didn't work in the end. Uh, we were a bit shaken when we saw this decision model. Shaken, but not beaten, of course. We just went looking for a different decision model. Oh, and excellent tell, choice, yeah, sure, excellent choice. Yeah. Okay, so let's go. We came up with this one. Let's go. Well, that first question, I actually like it. Do you actually have a problem? If you don't have a problem, <laughs> it, ends, it ends directly. And I yeah, really yeah. like that. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, we do have a problem. <laughs> first question, could it have been fixed without a blockchain? Well, we've been running Works Council elections for decades already. Ever since the company exists. Yeah, so, probably. Yeah. So that's, that's a couple of decades. Yeah. Well, okay, try a normal database. Well, there you go again with your blockchain hype. You don't need it. Yeah, maybe that first decision model wasn't so bad after uh, all. Like it's the same exact, the same answer regardless. Yeah, I think it was correct after all. Yeah. So because of all this, we just had to revisit a few requirements for a voting application, and we tried to compare them to the char characteristics of blockchain. And so the next slide will also summarize. Yeah. Why we had a problem? I mean, Mart, can you see the problem here? Well, I I don't think it's that hard to spot. I mean, every characteristic that applies to a blockchain does not apply to an election and vice versa. So there's like zero overlap between the problem and the solution. I think that's, the, I think that's just a summary, yeah. right? Summarize that quite nicely. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> there's just zero overlap. You know, um, although in, in, in the beginning, it looked like the distributed nature and, and uh, uh, the transaction that will be permanent will be a very good fit to a use case. We, we really forgot to dive into blockchain and see that the, the whole concept of blockchain is that writers don't trust each other at all and that they are participating in the blockchain just for their own good, just because they want to make, I, know, I don't know, digital money or something. It would be a good use case for digital money, by the way. Um, more, on hey, that, well. uh, yeah, more on that another time. Um, so it was just not a very good fit when you really looked into the technology. Um, so it seemed like when I returned from this conference, I was blinded by some sort of weird positivity, like I could solve everything with it. Um, we really had to conclude that a regular database would just do the job just fine. And because we have done those kinds of projects like a gazillion times already, haven't we all, right? There wasn't really anything left to research. And lastly, to top it all off, the Bitcoin lost half of its value around the time we were doing the research project. Well, it was rather symbolic by then, I guess. Don't tell me you're enjoying this. I, I do. I actually do. Uh, <laughs> but don't 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 be too hard on yourself, Anna. I mean, 
what happened to you could basically happen to everyone here in the room, and it has happened to me before as well. What, you, what happened is that you fell victim to survivorship bias. Now, you might be wondering, what is survivorship bias? Let me explain that using this picture. This is a picture, maybe some of you have already seen it, maybe not, a picture of an airplane seen from the top. And this picture was uh, drawn during the Second World War, and it was based on observations that the US military date, uh, did on planes that returned from missions in the Pacific. So planes that returned back home in the US were investigated. Where do, you, do we see the bullet holes? Where do we see damage from grenades and other, other evil enemy parts? Um, <laughs> and they were all colored with a red dot. And we can clearly see the problem here, can't we? I mean, the, the wingtips, they're fully dotted. The front fuselage, dotted. And the tail, dotted. So the first conclusion when people saw this picture was, yeah, this is, this is pretty obvious. We got to increase the armoring at the wingtips, at the tail, and at the, fr uh, and at the front fuselage. Now, although this may be a very obvious reaction, it's not the correct reaction. Think about it for a minute. What would happen if somebody hit the plane there, at the engine, or maybe there, at the, at the back fuselage? The plane wouldn't return home. So by only looking at the survivors of the missions, the planes that actually got back and survived their mission, it's way too easy to draw a false conclusion upon the reality that you're observing. And this is also something that can really easily happen when you go to a conference. Because what are the types of talks that you typically hear at a conference? Did any one of you today hear a talk about something that went wrong and, and failed miserably? Can, can I show hands, please? Can I see hands, please? Two hands in a full room. Two hands. <laughs> you know what it means? You all visited the same talks and they didn't have any failures. <laughs> or there's just too few failures at a conference. And I actually think it's the latter thing. Now, the thing is, if you visit a talk and someone there proposes a solution to a problem, you have to keep in mind that this solution isn't going to solve everything. It solved the problem of the speaker. And that problem was a very specific problem in a very specific context. Now, if you apply this same solution to your problem, your problem might actually be different from theirs. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't. Their context may be different from yours. Maybe you know it, or worse, you don't. Simply copying their solution from their problem and their context to yours is probably not going to solve your problem, even if the problem is exactly the same. If it would work that way in the world, we wouldn't be speaking about TDD or ATDD or BDD. We would be doing CDD. That would be the only thing in our industry. We'd be doing conference-driven development. We'd visit a conference every now and then, attend a few talks, enjoy them, maybe have a good laugh, get back home and blindly copy whatever we've learned to our world and we'd be happy after all. <laughs> that would be the only industry standard that we would know of. Yeah, it seems to me if you blindly copy a solution to your own uh, domain, you quickly suffer from over-engineering. Now, over-engineering is the act of designing a product to be more robust or have much more features than you really need. or for a process to be unnecessarily complicated. Um, so, problem is, at conferences like this, we mostly hear about success stories. And it wouldn't be, it'd be helpful if we could get a list of failed projects or over-engineered projects so that we could learn from the mistakes that they made right there. If only we could get a list of them. Right? Well, there's a Wikipedia page for that, of course. Yeah, I did, I did some homework for you guys and girls. I, did, I, I went to the, the link and I scrolled through the list of over-budget and over-engineered projects and I found a few marvelous gems to share with you. Although the first example has been all over the Dutch news, so we, I didn't really need Wikipedia for that one. So project number one is a population registration system uh, ordered by the Dutch government um, 
in Dutch again, gemeentelijke basisadministratie, which has been going on for over 15 years. And total cost uh, until now 100 million euros. Um, the worst thing is it has been cancelled in 2016 and there's nothing to show for it. Nothing at all, no working system. It's just cancelled and it has failed. Well, there's one thing to show for it. Um, in Parliament, there was a discussion in uh, at the end of 2016. Why can't we see the source code that was produced by this project? And turns out, we can. It has been uploaded to GitHub. So if you want to check it out, yeah, if you the GitHub link and see and see what marvelous system has cost you, honest taxpayers, right? 100 million euros. Ugh. But of course, problems uh, are not just uh, in the Netherlands with systems like this. Uh, project number two is a patient record system or ordered by the British government. Are you seeing a pattern here? Government. Um, yeah, it took all, all, all over 11 years and the total cost was 9.8 billion pounds. Also cancelled. Nothing to show for it. And the final project I want to show you. This was a financial business reporting system ordered by the Australian government. That's right. Surprise, surprise. This took nine years, but it's still running. So technically, this is not a field project yet. The total cost has been over 1 billion US dollars. No idea why they counted it in US dollars, but that's on Wikipedia. So must be true. Um, and the primary cause of failure, this is an interesting one, is the file format that they chose for the business report. They chose a fairly new financial uh, um, data type, which is called XBRL. And uh, all, all press that was released on this project stated that XBRL was one of the main reasons why this project has been over budget and also very late, because this tool, this, this data type is not understood by everyone. So I'm guessing someone visited the talk, right? On a conference and thought, wow, XBRL, next silver bullet. We'll solve all our problems. It totally made this project late. At least it's not canceled yet, right? It's the only positive thing I can get out of this slide. In all of these cases, over-engineering led to time or budget-related issues, which in many cases means the project will fail eventually. So how do you uh, avoid getting caught in the prickly bushes of over-engineering? Well, there, often there's more than one way to achieve something, and that's how it works in real life, and that's also how it works in our industry. So most of the times it's relatively easy to identify alternatives. For example, if you go to a commercial talk which showcases a company's product, they will tell you this is the best product because it's a commercial talk and you should give us all your money and we will get you the best product. But of course there will be competitors. Why would it be a sponsor talk after all? Um, they wouldn't sponsor a talk if there wouldn't be any competitors. Um, so you can look for alternatives and think, well, this product does more or less exactly the same. You know, why should we choose XBRL as a reporting language? Surely there are a few others that we can use. Maybe they will work for our project, is what I would have said. Uh, and the same holds true for all kinds of tools or frameworks or libraries. There's often another one that does more or less the same thing, but emphasizes on a few different things. So try to broaden your scope and, and make a, a well-informed decision. So let's have a quick recap. We talked a bit about survivorship bias until now, and also why it can't just be true that a single approach will solve all your problems. I also told a few things about over-engineering, which can be a risk, and often over-engineering can even be the result of survivorship bias. But the question I really would like to get answered is, how do I beat this thing? How can I avoid getting biased towards the next silver bullet? And we think that beating survivorship bias centers around one very important event, the event that causes the bias in the first place, which is the software conference, right? We are in a very good space to, uh, location to, to appreciate this problem right now. Um, and there are things to be done while you are attending a conference, but you can also limit the influence of the silver bullets in preparing for a conference. And also, after the conference has ended, you can do a few things to limit the survivorship bias. So no worries at all, you all have a chance of beating it still. We created a little fake conference. 
to illustrate the things that we believe can be done. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Silver Bullet Con 2019. Woo! Yeah, thank you. <laughs> With talks on Silver Bullet technologies only. So it's great. Um, so once you receive a conference schedule, you could ask yourself if the problems that are being addressed, if you already understand it, if you, if you can appreciate the problem before you go into the talk. Um, so let's elaborate on this by using the example schedule of Silver Bullet Con. This is how a lot of people um, choose their personal talks, which I have done for a long time. Let's look at the first slot. Ooh, keyboard layouts. Yeah, geeky. I like it. Or beware of survivorship bias. Oh, yeah. that looks yucky. Oh, that's not technical. No, no, no. I'll stick with the keyboard layouts. Great. We'll go to the keyboard layouts. So the 10 a.m. slot. Ooh, massive multiplayer online role playing games. Written in Haskell. <laughs> cool. Geeky. I like it. Let's go to that one. What's the other one? Kubernetes introduction. No, 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 no. The, the, the gaming with Haskell. Great. 11 a.m. slot. Monitoring Kubernetes with Prometheus or return of the blockchain? Ba, 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 you know? No, no, I'm done with blockchain talk. You know, they, they won't solve anything. So, yeah, let's go to uh, the modern monitoring Kubernetes with Prometheus. That, that sounds like it would be uh, interesting and I could learn something. And see what has happened here. Before you know it, you have filled the better part of your day with the fun stuff, which is not forbidden, of course, but the talk that really could help you out at work is probably this one or this one. Oh, there we go. And the one in the, in, in the bottom left is an, obviously an advanced talk because it's not about Kubernetes introduction, it's about monitoring Kubernetes. So suppose you don't have any Kubernetes experience at all. If you read your schedule left to right and pick all the nice sessions, um, you, you can't really see that there is a certain order to the schedule. So most conference planners will, will really um, make sure that there is a chance to get an introduction to a certain uh, subject before you're uh, attending an advanced talk like this one. So what if you would read this conference schedule not left to right, but top to bottom? And you would just read, read through the tracks like this and like this, and you would see, ah, introduction to Kubernetes, and I also want to know something about Prometheus. So I, the best thing would be to visit this one, then I would know what the Kubernetes is, and then I could visit that one, and I, I could learn how I could monitor it. And of course, you got a free, uh, a free slot in the 9 a.m. Well, by all means, vis visit the Geeky Talk if you want. I mean, we are allowed to have a little fun once in a while, right? Um, so try, try to read the conference schedule top to bottom and see what path you can plan for yourself and make sure it is, uh, it is next to your own experience. What you also could do is use the time between a few talks to gain some experience, read up on the problem that is presented. Mm. Uh, what you also could do is just put the advanced talk in like a, a, li a list that you could revisit a few months after the conference and just watch the talk on YouTube after you have done some things with Kubernetes. Maybe you can appreciate the monitoring talk a bit better after that. And try to build your personal conference schedule accordingly. Try to value topics that are relevant to your current experience. Value those over the next silver bullet. Um, so I think that will be a good idea. And also make sure you meet the prerequisites. Some talks come with prerequisites. Uh, some speakers lay them out in the talk abstract. So if there is advice by the speaker, if they say some experience with Kubernetes is, uh, is required to fully appreciate this talk, well done, just take the advice of the speaker. I would like to bring up another point, and that's the hype cycle. Who here is familiar with the hype cycle? Can I see a few hands? Yeah, almost half of you, that's great. So the hype cycle, for those who don't know, that's not a problem, it's a, a graphical presentation that was developed by Gartner, uh, the research company, uh, to represent the maturity, the adoption, and also the social application of specific technologies. So it's like uh, a popularity contest for technology products. And this is how a typical hype cycle looks. Now, as a part of your conference preparation, you could take a look at the hype cycle and ask yourself, what current, so uh, the, the technology that I want to learn today, in what phase is this technology currently? So is it at, at the peak right now? 
or is it just on the rise? It's very new, or what is it? If it's like proven technology, then it will be right here. Um, because the current phase will determine the types of talk that are available on the subject. Let's let's look at an example again from Silver Bullet Con, the best conference in the world, <laughs> apparently. Um, so if uh, if you're looking at talks about NoSQL, I I thought let's pick another topic be because we have done some bashing on blockchain already. So <laughs> let's pick something different. Um, so if a, a talk about NoSQL is in, in the days that NoSQL was on the rise and not not a lot of people had heard about it, a talk will be titled NoSQL: The New Reality or something, the very new reality. So this. Effectually, this means you should really try this out on a free evening, you know, if you have some spare time, just to see how it works. L a little fun thing, not too important. At the peak, the talk title will be NoSQL will change your life, fix your projects, get you a cute girlfriend, get your three children, and, and, and make your life success all the way. Doesn't say it like that, but I'm thinking it afterwards. Um, this is major silver bullet alert. Don't get carried away. It seems like it can solve everything. Well, it won't, and you should ask very critical questions. When a product is sliding into the trough of disillusionment, a lot of people have tried it out already and have, have seen that it's not the solution to everything. So you could see a talk like how we do NoSQL at Cool Incorporated. There are some cool company that talks about how, how they managed a former silver bullet that has disappointed a few people, but how they try to still make it useful, like, like um, uh, things they, they do in a day, on a day-to-day -day basis, some tips and tricks. When this product is climbing the slope in the hype cycle, the trust is slowly being restored in the, pro in the product, and these tips and tricks that you saw in the previous talk will be compiled into patterns or practices, and maybe a book will be published on modern NoSQL patterns and practices, and it will be like standard knowledge. And if you enter the plateau, well, then there will be people who think we should do, do NoSQL 2.0 with a new implementation database like Silver Bullet DB, and this Silver Bullet DB thing will start its own hype cycle. So make sure that you really appreciate what is the current phase of my technology. The hype cycle phase will determine the types of talks that will be available. So be prepared for them and pre be prepared for the bias that is in that is related to these hype cycle phases. Well, this is a no-brainer, I guess, but the best talks contain pros and cons. And the best speakers will tell you, I thought it was a great solution, but there were a few things I wasn't really happy about. Write them down or memorize them so that you can read through them after the conference has ended. And that you can really ask yourself, is this a drawback that is really, that's going to hurt my project a lot? Or don't, do we don't have to care about it? Use the Q&A at the end of the talk. If the speaker doesn't mention any drawbacks, just ask them, are there any, any drawbacks to this solution? What if I want to apply this technology tomorrow? Will my project suffer from a few cons or are there no cons at all? Well, it seems scary, of course, but I think the audience will appreciate this because everything in the audience is, um, is thinking the same as you are. How can I apply this in my project and will there be dangers or, or risks? So if you ask that question, I think everyone in the audience will want to hear the answer. They will be rooting for you, I guess. Well, if you think asking a question after a talk is, uh, is a little bit scary, I can totally relate to that. To that. So try to arrange a hallway meeting. You bump into speakers uh, uh, during the breaks, right? So just ask them the question then. We call this the hallway track. It, it's ne nowhere to be found on the conference schedule, but I think it's by far the most important track of any software conference the hallway track, speakers who are available to answer questions. I think, I think your people will do, will do the same thing, just networking with other colleagues and exchanging tips and tricks about certain technologies. Very important track, the hallway track. And actually, speakers really seem to like this. The most exciting part for me is the one-to-one -one conversations with developers in the hallways. I've seen this multiple times. They really like it, so don't be shy and just ask them. Um, and if a, a speaker has flown in from a foreign country, I think they are even more inclined to meet with you because they won't have their coworkers here, right? Maybe a few friends that they met abroad, but not their friends from their own country. So they will be looking for a good conversation, making new friends. 
Um, having said that, we are two Dutch guys living in our own country, so do please bump into us later. <laughs> if we're not just looking for foreign friends, also for domestic friends, no problem. Um, and if you think this is scary also, just ask the question on Twitter. Do it, uh, do it via a direct message. I think they will all, always respond to it and uh, they're very helpful. So ask your questions and ask about drawbacks. So this is all about pre preparing for the conference and things to do during the conference. Now, what can you do after you get home? Um, Martin, maybe you can tell us something about it. What do you do after you come home and how do you beat the bias after the conference has ended? Thank you. There's, a, there's quite a few things you can do. Mm. First thing is um, give yourself some time to reevaluate what you've learned. You've, you've heard sessions from speakers and they describe problems and you might relate to those problems because they sound familiar. Now give yourself some time and, and think, how would I actually solve the same problem? If I had the same problem, how would I solve that? But be a bit hard on yourself. Don't use the solution that you've just learned at the conference. Try to think of an alternative. Can you actually do it another way using tools or techniques that you already know and that you already have applied before? That's actually challenging at first, especially the, the first few times that you do it. It can be really hard because every, everything in your brain says, yeah, but I have the solution. I've just heard it yesterday and it's so easy. And it well, Don't go there. Try the things that you already know and map them to the problem that, that you've learned about and see if, it, if you can actually address the problem that way. The second thing that you can do is start playing around with the technologies and the, and the frameworks and the tools that you've learned about. Or call it building or call it tinkering. I don't really care how you, how you call it, but start doing it. Download the tool or the framework, start building something. It can be a very simple thing, it doesn't have to be complex or something, but just try to, to use it and see what happens if you run it on your machine. Actually, our coworker Tom has a very uh, nice talk uh, on that last year at DevOx. It's about, about 15 minutes, so if you have 15 spare minutes left, please visit, uh, please watch that talk. It's on YouTube. It's it's a very fun talk, and he actually describes what you can learn by just doing it yourself, tinkering around, and and getting acquainted with new technology. The, by the way, there will be slides afterwards posted online, and if everything goes well, they have clickable links, so you can just click on those few words and you'll be redirected immediately. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, what is actually very interesting about that approach is that you're actually performing a, an, an experiment in the scientific uh, meaning of the word. So what, what scientists typically do, they, 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 they research something, and then they write a paper, and they describe the field of research, and what they've done to, to actually gain new results. And then what do other scientists do? They just try the same thing again. So they're, they're, they're buying the same machines and they're setting up the same experiment and just trying to repeat the whole process and see if it also works for them. Okay, they also do other stuff, but that's one of the things that scientists do. And what you're actually doing, if you, if you try to repeat what you've learned at a conference by doing it yourself, is that you're also doing an experiment. You're seeing uh, if you can actually reproduce the problem that you've learned about as well as the solution that you've learned about. And this is interesting because it will probably tell you that it doesn't work exactly the same way as you've learned. Is that a problem? Is it? Of course not. I see people nodding, uh, waving their heads. That perfect answer. That's no problem at all. It just tells you that there's some factor that you aren't aware of and that differs their situation from yours. Maybe it's a factor that you can actually identify, that you can point at and say, yeah, see, they, they are running on a public cloud and I'm just running on a single node laptop here in, 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 in my, uh, on my desk. Well, that's an identify, identifiable difference. Maybe it's a difference that you cannot identify. Maybe it's just luck and then, well, it might mean you're out of luck. Well, too bad for you. Um, but let's hope it's something that you can actually identify, that you can point at and say, yeah, that's why the solution works for them, but not for me. Totally fine. And when you do that, and when you look on the internet, searching for uh, other publications on the subject, it might be interesting to actually try to fill this little table. See, given the problem, how many people did the same thing to solve the problem? 
just count them. You don't have to read all those, those blog posts. You don't have to watch all the videos on YouTube. You don't have to read all the print articles. Really, just don't, but just count. How many did the same thing and succeeded? How many did the same thing but did not succeed? And how many took another approach and fi either failed or succeeded? And by filling this table, you get an, an, a nice idea of, is this actually a common way to solve the problem we're facing? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But this is dangerous. Why is this dangerous? Anyone dare to take a guess? Yes, please. Excellent answer, thank you. Please, a an, an hand of applause, please. Very good answer. Great. Perfect answer. The thing <laughs> is, what do we read on the internet? We read the success stories. We read the things that go well and that gave epic successes and everyone's happy and every problem is fixed. So, what do we need? We actually need more failures. And I think everyone in this room has their own failures, their own things that they tried and did not succeed. I have mine, you might have yours. But we typically don't really dare to step up and say that we have. At least, I don't. It's, I don't feel comfortable doing that. I've thought about a project just... Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, <laughs> thanks for that. Maybe you should write a blog post about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I will. <laughs> I mean, that really is the clue here. We need to, people like you and me to step up and say, well, I've tried to apply this technique to this problem, and, well, it turns out it's not a solution. It's just something you should not do. Bonus points if you actually include the lessons that you've learned from this, this endeavor that you've made. Okay, I've learned that I should do this first before considering that. I've learned that there's a big difference between A and B. Whatever the lesson is that you've learned, please include that in, in the way that you talk about your failures. And talking about failures, although it might give us an uncomfortable feeling, is actually a good thing because you learn from it in the first place by actually saying it out loud and, and thinking about it before you actually start talking about it. Um, but also it helps the people around you who actually read your story or hear it. Another thing, mastering your tools, very important. I believe there was a session earlier today about mastering your tools. I saw it too late to actually attend it, but it, it's really, it's of crucial importance that you actually master the tools that you have in your toolbox. Every one of us has a toolbox with the stuff that we have used before and that we know and that we love how to use. Or, well, do we love it? Sometimes we actually hate the tools that we use. And we, we actually go to a conference and, and we're facing a new tool that promises the same thing but better. And we go with that tool because it, it's better. That's what the speaker just told me. Now, that, that's a very natural reflex, but please try to... Uh, try to refrain from that and not do that. I guess I'm getting a new mic for the second time already. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yes, it's on, thank you. Mastering your tools. It's no offense by, by all means, by the way. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> As I said, mastering your tools. If you know the, the, the tools that you already know, you probably hate them because you know every downside they have. And you've used it so often that you know this quirk and you know this, this little tiny thingy where it doesn't quite work. To give you a, a, an example I recently had with a tool that I use quite often. It's called Maven. I think many of us know Maven, right? I mean, it's the de facto standard in Java world. Um, and I've, I've often used the dependency tree command which tells me for a given Java project, a, a tree-like structure of each and every dependency that's somewhere used in my project. And I've had situations like, I don't know how many times, where I was like, hey, my application is having, I don't know, Spring Batch? How did I end up with Spring Batch in my project? I don't even write batch software. Where did that come from? So what I would do, I would say Maven dependency tree, redirect the output to a text file, 
and then start grabbing around. Or maybe if I felt like it, I would start uh, Vim and, and, and look for the, the spring batch, or, or maybe I would just pipe the output through, through, through grab or something, which is quite inconvenient because you only see the line with spring batch, and you're like, yeah, that doesn't help me because I wanted to know how I have it. So, uh, well, uh, grab, that's um, it's minus capital C, right, for, for three lines of context, right? Or is it, or is it lower C? Uh, K capital, capital C, C. okay. <laughs> I typically forget this, as you noticed. Sorry? Oh, minus capital E. Well, anyway, <laughs> the thing is, I typically forget it, and then I have to look it up, and it takes me a lot of time. And then I found out, hey, look at that. There's a parameter for that. I can just say includes, and I can say, oh, well, just in only includes the artifacts that are called spring batch whatever. Group ID doesn't matter. Version doesn't matter. Just tell me those artifacts. And it will actually display the tree pointing towards that specific artifact. And that's exactly the information I was looking for. And the first reflex might have been like, hey, Maybe the dependency tree doesn't quite do what I want it to do. Maybe it's time for this, 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 this separate tooling that gives a, a, a nice graphical representation of my dependency tree or something. No, no, no. The tool that I already had in my toolbox for, for 10 years or something does the job just fine. It's only that I didn't know. So what I want to say with this, it's definitely worth investing time to actually improve the way you work with your current tools. It might not always be the coolest thing to do, but investing some time and actually really learning to master and appreciate your tools can actually bring you further. And it will also help you when some new tool is being announced to say, oh, well, hey, but the tools that I already have, they do the job just fine. There is, by the way, a final warning on this thing. Because as Abraham Maslow already pointed out, it's kind of tempting to look at every problem that you're facing, having a hammer in your hand. Oh, look, it's a nil. I know how to do that. Even if it's not a nil at all. So there's a balance to be made here. You need to know what your tools can do, but you also need to know what your tools cannot do. I had a blockchain in my hand, by the you, way. I, you probably, yeah. well, I think in both hands, yeah, actually. Yeah, but two blockchains. So They were very heavy. Yeah, they, <laughs> I can see why. Congrats to all of you. Uh, many of you have made it to the end, and I'm very happy to see that. There's a few things I would like you to take home uh, after leaving the room. Um, there's been a lot of things that we've been discussing, but the three main points regarding to us are the following. First of all, it is really a good thing to talk about whatever went wrong in your professional life. Share them. You can anonymize them. You don't have to include all gory details that nobody wants to know, but at least share what went wrong and what you've learned from it. Second thing, start playing around, start tinkering, start building, start doing it yourself. It doesn't have to be an epic architectural thing, big software projects, but just the essence of the talk that you've attended and you're like, hey, that sounds interesting. What can it do for me? And last but not least, we hope to see you in the hallway track. Thank you so much. Thank you. There's uh, room for a couple of questions, I guess. Please raise your hand if you have a question. I will we'll try to repeat it before answering it. First one, yes, please. That's an interesting question. Two years ago on JSpring, there was the same call to action. People, please share your failures, share what you've learned from them. And apparently, because I'm repeating uh, the call here, nothing has happened in between. What can we do to actually improve that? Wow, that, that's, that's a difficult one actually to start with because the reasons why people don't do that are, obviously, are, are often very personal. Um, it can be shame, it can be guilt, it can be 
whatever. And what what refrains you or me from from sharing that? It's 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 actually a question. Looking at myself, why do don't I do that? Why do I only blog about things that go well? I'm afraid I don't have an uh, no. a direct answer to that. There's a suggestion here yeah. from the front row. Failure track. Add a, co a conference track about failures and just fill it with talks yeah. that are about things that went wrong or even have a separate conference failure con 2020. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. I see there's a lot of, uh, of, of enthusiasm about this idea, so let's make that happen. Any other questions, please? Yes, please. My biggest failure. <laughs> that, that's a good one. Um, and I'm going to answer it. I've once run a project um, where I kind of forgot to um, to make clear up front how many budget there was for running the system when, once it would be finished. So we had a, a very nice architecture, and it involved quite some, some infrastructure as well, because, well, scaling, yay! <laughs> and then it turned out that somehow, the customer expected the system to run within a certain operational budget. And that didn't quite fit. I want So to... what I've learned from that is um, make sure at the start of the project that you have a clear idea of how many budget there is for operational cost. Thank you. Um, uh, before you actually start uh, uh, designing your architecture and stuff. You want to share one as well? well? Very quick, because we're out of time. Yeah. I, one, I once ran an update query on a production database without a where clause. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't my first year, I have to admit, but I'm very ashamed still. But it's out yeah. in the open now, yeah. so <laughs> learn from it. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>